Hey everybody, welcome back. Have you ever wondered how to make your own code profiler or wondered how to instrument function calls in C? Well, you're going to in a few minutes. So today's video comes from Alexander's comment asking, is it possible to launch some predetermined procedure before calling any function without copying and pasting code throughout? Because of course, copy and pasting code throughout would be ugly. So I saw this and I thought, ooh, I need to make a video on this. But first of all, why would you wanna do this? Well, maybe you're trying to profile some code. You're trying to see how often a particular function gets called. Maybe you're trying to find out how fast, how long, how much time you're taking in each of your functions. You're basically trying to get insight into how your program is actually running at runtime. This could be for debugging purposes, for testing purposes, or to figure out what you should optimize. But whatever the reason, the idea is that I want to insert a little bit of code before and after each function call. So before I call a function, I wanna run a little of my own code. And after the function call returns, I wanna be able to run some code as well. And that way I can record things about what's going on. So I have to admit, when I first saw Alexander's comment, I'm thinking to myself, I know this is possible. I can think of a variety of ways to do it. I'm not actually sure what the best way to do it is. I knew you could do this through binary rewriting, which is where like, basically after you compile your code, you go back through and you change the binary in order to insert your own code here and there. That seems like a pain. And I didn't really have time to go down that path today because that seemed a bit heavy handed. And I thought surely there's gotta be an easier way. And of course with C, the easiest place to do this would be in the compiler. When you're generating the code yourself, why not just stick in some extra function calls? That seems to be the place to do it. So I checked and lo and behold, GCC and Clang have an option that basically does this for you. So let's look at a quick example of how this works. So we're first gonna start out with a simple program. Now it doesn't really do much. It's got two functions, F1 and F2 and main of course, main calls both functions. F2 is going to call F1 just to make things a little more interesting because I wanted to see nested function calls but there's really nothing complicated here. I also have a simple make file that I'm going to use to compile this code. This is all pretty standard stuff. I have videos on all of this. If there's anything in here that seems strange, whether it's beginner C stuff, make files or anything like that, I probably have a video for it. I'll put some links to some that I think are related in the description, but feel free to search my channel for related content. And now back to the code, just to make sure we're starting off on the right foot. If let's compile it and run it. If we do that, you can see that it runs. It prints out a few messages, letting us know that the functions were called and it finishes. So that's all pretty straightforward. If we're going to instrument our function calls, we're going to go back to our make file and add this flag, this F instrument functions compile option. Now what this is going to do is this is going to insert just a little bit of code before each function call happens. And then after each return, it's going to insert some code. But what code is it going to insert? That's the question. Well, if we try to compile it now, you're going to see that it's complaining about two missing functions. Okay, so the sig profile func enter and sig profile func exit. So the way this works is that the compiler calls these two functions. These are, there are special names that were predetermined. I didn't come up with them. Before each function call, this sig profile func enter is going to be run. And then when we exit a function call, we're going to get this sig profile func exit. That's going to be called. But right now, those functions don't exist because we have to write them and they're going to look like this. Okay, so this is, this is just how they have to look. This is how they're predefined. It looks a little messy, let me break it down for you. So both functions are void, so they don't return anything. They each take two pointers. The first is the address of the function that we're calling. So that's the function that's being called. And it's an address because it's basically the location in memory where that code exists. The second is the address in memory where the call was made from. So this is the address of the code that made the function call. And then finally, we add this attribute at the end and all this is saying is please don't instrument these functions. Because you can imagine what would happen if you try to instrument your instrumentation functions, you end up with this, I'm assuming a infinitely recursive loop and it's probably gonna stack overflow, it's gonna crash, it's gonna make a mess. Okay, so now that we have these function prototypes, let's define the actual functions and have them actually do something. For now, we're just gonna have them print stuff out. That'll help us see what's going on. So let's just print out a little arrow to let me know whether we are entering a function or exiting. And then let's print out the two pointers and we'll do the same thing down in exit. Okay, so that's gonna be a good start. Now let's compile the code and run it. And it worked. Now you can see that it instrumented main as well. 
That's this first call. And it's coming from some address up in libc. We didn't write that code. It's just the system calling main. And then when f1 is called, we see this address, that's f1's address. And this is the address in main, the location in memory in main where it was called. And we also can see where f1 finishes. Now on the exit, you'll notice that the call site is the same as it was for the entrance. Now this tells us where it's returning to. It could also be helpful in matching it up, the exit with the entry. And then of course you see the same basic pattern when F2 is called, except that now we have another call inside F2. So you get the entrance into F2, then the entrance into F1, and then you get the exit from F1 and then the exit from F2. So they're nested. Also note, it's interesting, we don't get instrumentation information about printf. Now all of this instrumentation stuff is happening at compile time. And since printf is in libc, we didn't compile it. So it doesn't actually have that code injected into it. So as is, this is not going to give you information about the code in third-party libraries or really any code you didn't compile unless you download them, you can get the source and recompile them yourself. I'll leave that up to you to try that out, but it's definitely an option. Now at this point it works and we could stop here, but you may all be wondering just how helpful this information really is. I mean, we just have a bunch of addresses and what if this were a more complicated program and I didn't wanna, maybe I didn't know what the addresses are or I couldn't just figure out what they are from looking at it. Maybe I want names rather than just addresses. And so for this, we have a few options. The one that I'm going to go with today is object dump. I've covered object dump in previous videos. I'll link in the description, but basically I know I can use object dump like this to print out the symbol table for my program. And this shows me the addresses for my functions, but you're going to notice something interesting. And that is that these addresses don't match the addresses that our instrumentation functions printed out. So what's going on here? Well, what's happening, and this might work differently on different machines, is there's a security technique that is messing with us. Okay, my computer is generating what's called a position independent executable. That means that every time this program runs, the code is being stuck in a different location. And this makes certain types of cyber attacks harder to pull off. Note I didn't say impossible, but it makes them more challenging. And this is super useful, but it's getting in the way. It's not helping us here. So for now, let's just change our make file a bit and I'm gonna turn this off. So this just tells the linker, when you're linking, do not generate a position independent executable. This means that the code, the variables, everything's going to basically be in the same location in memory each time I run it. And so now let's recompile the program. And now when we run it, you're going to notice that the addresses match those numbers that we saw in the symbol table. And of course, all these addresses are in hexadecimal. If you're wondering about that, please see my previous video about why hex is so important. If you haven't learned it, please learn it. It will save your life. So now I can just match up the symbol information with the output. And I could do this by hand for simplicity because of course we're programmers. We don't wanna do anything by hand. We wanna automate everything. I wrote a quick Ruby script that basically is just gonna call object dump for me. It's going to parse the output into a dictionary or a hash, and then it's gonna read my program's output in from standard in. And anytime it sees one of my profiler lines, I'm just gonna detect those with a regular expression right here. But anytime it sees one of these, I'm going to try to look up the function and just add the name to the output if it finds it in the symbol table. Okay, so really straightforward. All it's doing is it's looking for these hexadecimal addresses if it happens to say, ooh, this one was in the symbol table, then it's going to stick the name right with it. And now we can run our program piping its output into our Ruby script. And now we have the names, at least for the calls. Notice that we don't get the names for the call sites because they're not in the symbol table. If we wanted name information for these, like maybe we wanted to print out what function and line number the call came from, for that, we'd have to do something a bit fancier. We might need to look at the debug information in the binary, but we're not going to get that far in today. One thing I do wanna to do today though, is I wanna talk about what happens if we don't wanna turn off PIE. So this was kind of cheating. I said, hey, security is getting in my way. Why don't I just turn it off? And turning off PIE is fine when you're testing and debugging. Like there's no problem with that, but let's say you're trying to do this type of instrumentation in production code or some other scenario where you want PIE to be enabled. Well, you're gonna notice that these addresses, they do change every time, but notice that they're always in the same place relative to each other. So if we can figure out how much they're shifted, we can just figure out what their actual value should be. And we also know that this first line here is always going to tell me where main is. And so I'm gonna update my Ruby script really quickly just to catch the first line and compute the offset for main. 
Basically, I'm just computing how far they're shifting main. And you notice that I'm ignoring the offset portion. I'm just looking at the page information, the page number that they're using. To fully understand this, you gotta understand how virtual memory works and we're not gonna get there today. But I'm really trying to figure out how my variables and symbols are being offset, where they're being shifted and placed in memory. But then once we know what this shift is, then we can just adjust all of our addresses by that much. And now we can go back and put PIE back in and now things still work. And now we're able to see which symbol we're looking at just by checking to see where it is related to main. And of course, there are other ways that we could get this information and there's a lot of things we could do to clean up this code. But so this is pretty cool. And so now you know how to write your own code profiler. Now you know how to instrument your own code using a compiler flag that I didn't even know was there. As always, my source code is available through Patreon. Thanks, Alexander, for this great video idea and for inspiring me to learn something new. Thank you all for watching. Subscribe if you don't wanna miss the next video. Don't forget to click that bell. That's how you actually get notifications. Like this video if you wanna send a message to YouTube that this is good content that other people should see. And I will see you next time. Happy coding, everyone.